Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SAIE Lightning Chapter webinar on Lightning Protection of PV Systems, Lessons Learned. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. And by default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SAIE YouTube channel, SAIEE TV, under the Lightning Chapter playlist. You will find the registration link in the chat box. Please register and you'll receive a notification once the recording has been uploaded. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few days after this webinar once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to introduce you now to our host today, Dr. Hugh Hunt. He's the chairman of the Lightning Chapter. He's also a senior lecturer in the School of Electrical and Information Engineering at WITS. He was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, and completed his PhD at the University of Witwatersrand, looking at the use of lightning location system data in forensic investigations. He has worked with the South African Lightning Detection Network in, and Brazil with the RINDAT system. Dr. Hunt currently heads the Johannesburg Lightning Research Laboratory, and he, as I mentioned, the chairperson of the SI Lightning Chapter. Over to you, Dr. Hunt. Thank you very much. So firstly, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, a big welcome. It's great to see so many people in the webinar this evening. Um, and uh, I think we're going to have a very enjoyable talk. Um, this really marks the first event we're having as in my role as the chairperson of the SAA Lightning Chapter. But I must offer a big thanks to my, my two office bearers, um, Mr. Rydal Jardine and Mr. Richard Everett, who have been really driving things <laughs> for the last um, few months since I took over as chair. And um, they've really helped make this come together. So thanks to them. Um, I think the important thing is just the reason for this webinar is during the chapter meetings, we put together a, a bit of a poll. We, we discussed amongst the group a number of topics on lightning and lightning protection that we thought might be of interest. and. Um, there's a few other topics that came up, which we'll be addressing in the future, but overwhelmingly the, pop, the popular opinion was looking at lightning protection of um, renewable energy systems, but then that became focused very much on the PV and the photo photovoltaic aspect of this. I suppose um, while this has been developing for some time, we've all become very aware of PV um, and, and the need for these types of systems this year and over the last two years really, um, and, and I think it's a very topical issue. Um, it's also not entirely covered, uh, the, the way forward on protecting PVCs is not, uh, we, we're having to come up with solutions our, ourselves here, we're not just looking to an international set of um, engineering approaches. And I think it's really great that I, the presenters we have here today are people who are really working with this in South Africa here at the moment. Um, and hence the title of the presentation, Lessons Learned. So this is an ongoing project, and I guess we're, we're all learning together as we go forward. Um, and that takes me to, I'd just like to offer a big thanks to Dr. Pretorius, Mr. Scobie, and then Richard and Mr. Evert for, for um, agreeing to be presenters at this, um, for this webinar. And I think they'll add a lot of value to, to you all today. And with that, um, oh, let me just briefly go over structure for the, the, the evening. So uh, how we'll have it is we'll have first up, Dr. Pretorius will present. Then we'll, if any questions come up during his presentation, we'll take a couple of brief questions just to address anything immediate, but we won't spend too long on questions after the presentation. We'll then just go to our next presenter, Mr. Scovey. Similarly, a brief question time. Then Mr. Evert. And then we'll open the floor up to a much larger Q&A session and where we can spend some time answering questions. And then we'll close. So with that, um, let's get to our first presenter, Dr. Peter Pretorius. 
Peter Praturis received a B in electrical and electronics degree from the Potsdam University in 1985, an M in bioengineering degree from the University of Pretoria in 1990, and a PhD from the University of the Witwatersrand in 2000. He joined ESCOM, the major utility in South Africa, in 1988 as an engineer in training at the Matimba power station. He enjoyed further career gro growth at ESCOM over a 17-year period to the level of corporate consultant in electromagnetic compatibility until 2005, when his career turned to private consultant. Peter, thank you very much for agreeing to present today, and we look forward to your presentation. Um, sorry, Peter, you muted. There we Apologies go. for that. Uh, thank you, you for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, also thank you to the SAIE for the uh, opportunity uh, to do this presentation uh, this afternoon. And uh, good afternoon or good evening to all in the audience. Uh, let me just see if I can, I'm just going to switch off my video and I'll share my screen just now. Uh, That's coming through to us. Okay, I just need to see if I can move this window. All right, it's coming through. Should go to presentation mode now. Just want to confirm, can you everybody see that? Okay, perfect, thank you. So in line with the uh, theme of this uh, webinar this afternoon, um, my presentation will be on some of the lessons learned in large uh, solar PV systems or plants. I want to follow, oops, let me just see here. I have to click here. I want to follow the following overview. Uh, first of all, I just want to outline the problem from which the lessons were learned. Then there are three aspects that we need to look at to, to arrive at the lessons learned. First of all, uh, we will look at the lightning coupling mechanism involved. And you will, as you will all aware of, there are quite a few coupling mechanisms involved. And but for because of the time available and the focus of this presentation, we're only going to focus on one of it. And uh, I'll elaborate a bit more on the coupling me mechanism in a slide or two. Then we have to look at the technology that was affected, the equipment in the plant that was affected, and also the damage mechanism. How did the lightning actually cause the damage that we're going to talk about? Then we'll uh, end with uh, some concluding remarks and uh, lessons learned. So just to outline the problem, uh, we're talking here about a large utility scale PV plant in South Africa. And uh, I will not reveal too many details of uh, about the plant to protect the entity, um, apart from maybe saying that we, if we talk about utility scale PV plants, we're talking about plants, say, about 60 megawatt and larger. Um, then, uh, so in this case, the, this plant, uh, there was lighting damage experienced at the plant. Um, some initial lighting protection was installed. I th don't think it's important that we go through the type of uh, uh, lighting protection that was installed, apart from saying that uh, follow-up uh, mitigation was then applied after the, uh, there was still lighting damage occurring at the plant. And this included the installation of surge protective devices on some of the oh, uh, some of the communication circuits, and I'll show you uh, in time what uh, where these were installed. Um, then, what was observed following the application of the lighting uh, mitigation that was applied? Uh, that it was actually observed that more damage was experienced during lightning events compared to the before the uh, uh, follow-up mitigation was applied. And this was this raised a couple of questions. Why is this occurring? And what is the actual uh, mechanism associated with that? So uh, we were approached to investigate this and to determine the root cause. And we will talk about this in time to come. 
So the coupling mechanism that we are going to focus on today is the is lightning ground potential rise. And this slide typically shows the development of such or what is meant by lightning ground potential rise. And uh, we're referring here to the North American term ground potential rise in, uh, in Europe it's, or in South Africa. It's typically also referred to as earth potential rise. Um, but we will stick to then the, I think, the more familiar term of ground potential rise. So when a lightning strike uh, terminates on a, a structure or even on the ground, you will find at the strike point, there's a rise in the earth potential. And as you move away from that strike point, the potential will fall to lower levels. And this potential is uh, typically uh, presented as a result of the soil resistivity. It's a function of the soil resistivity. And if you also, if you have an electrode buried in the soil, the impedance of that uh, electrode also plays a part. So what is, uh, will be of importance to us in terms of uh, this discussion is the, the fact that we see as we move away from this, the strike point, uh, as indicated in this slide by the R1, the radii R1 and R2, we, we, we observe that we can get uh, a difference in potential at these locations, particularly when you have a, a structure or a cable connected between the R1 point uh, on the potential pro profile and the uh, R2 point. And we'll look a bit more into that, what is the importance of that. I think it's also important to just show the, the uh, typical soil structure that is, uh, was uh, associated with this investigation. Um, at face value, this looks like uh, not too bad uh, in inverted commas from, uh, from an electrical perspective. A soil structure, I mean, we're talking uh, uh, the highest uh, resistivity value is just uh, is under 500 ohm meters. Um, and the top layer under 100 ohm meters, the bottom layer under 200 ohm meters. But I think it's important to realize that even at these lower, relatively lower resistivity values, ground potential rise can still be very important. Um, so on this uh, slide, you see here in the this area here, though they are the uh, fall in potentials from the strike point. We've uh, just plotted in uh, in this graph on a log log scale to present a more clearer clearer picture about what is happening uh, closer to the strike point, say 100 meters from that strike point. And the graph presents the ground potential rise versus the distance from the strike point for various uh, peak lightning current uh, current levels for 10 by 350 microsecond the lightning current impulse. So if we look at the bottom one, uh, this dotted line with the uh, cir cir circle markers, this is typically, let's say, for a one kiloampere peak lightning current uh, with that soil structure. And we can see then if we look at the, in this table here at the bottom, we see the EMC specifications of the equipment some of the communication equipment in the plant. And uh, I've just uh, grayed out the identification and the equipment because it's sensitive information, uh, trusting that you will ac accept that. But what is of importance is that we see the withstand capability of this equipment is of the order of one kV uh, on the signal ports and typically two kV on the power ports. Now, if we look at this graph again, uh, let's take the this dotted profile. This is the 10 kiloampere. It's a relatively low peak lighting current, uh, well below the median value of say around 32 kiloampere um, uh, for negative lightning or uh, lightning strikes. And we can see here that up to 100 meters, based on this calculation, we're already sitting above the one kilovolt level. Um, so it points to the wide area of influence, the large zone of influence that develops under lighting uh, ground potential rise, even in uh, relatively good soil resistivity conditions. Now, I must point out here, you'll see at the top of the slide, uh, the values need, need to be adjusted downward. What I mean by that is that uh, because of uh, 
the time that was available for this investigation, we had to optimize the numerical modeling. We did not include soil permittivity, for example, and also we did not include soil ionization. Now, if you exclude those two aspects, you end up with a ground potential rise that is significantly higher than that will actually be presented in real life. But nevertheless, we uh, introduced a, a downward scaling factor of about 75%, just to make sure that we're very conservative in, in terms of this. And if we look at this, uh, ground potential level above one kilowatt, or the zone of influence, or the boundary of that zone of influence then uh, taken as one kilowatt, we see the number of equipment uh, or components that are affected by that ground potential rise when the uh, lightning current is of certain value. And you can see here, we're talking uh, of a low number of components, four typically, and this is specifically related to this plant during a lightning peak current of one kilo ampere. And, but what is important here is if we move down this uh, row of, uh, and with the, uh, looking at these bullet points, we see that the, the number of components that are affected grow significantly when the lightning peak current uh, is uh, uh, increased. So here again, we're talking about relatively low values, say about 14 kilo ampere, but we can already see that we're talking about 785 components that may be affected. And this is where the importance come in, uh, uh, particularly with regard to the density of the equipment that we see on, on the, uh, typically associated with uh, a large utility scale PV plant. And obviously, if you go to higher lightning peak currents, um, many much more components will be affected. So we're talking kind of uh, about an economy of scale, and you can see uh, these components are not uh, very cheap, they, and uh, even at relatively low cost, uh, the cost can quickly run away just uh, by the number of components that are affected. So let's look at the, uh, we plot the uh, lightning GPR uh, concept there for a, mo a moment. And let's just look at the technology that was affected. Here we are talking about, uh, we can refer to that as wireline technology. In other words, the medium of the communication is um, uh, copper wires, uh, copper conductors, typically like a Cat5 cable. In this case, you can see here on this slide, it shows a shielded twisted pair cable that was used as a copper cable. And the, that is particularly associated with RS-485 communication uh, system. And in this case, we have got no surge protective devices installed, as you can see in the schematic uh, on the slide. A few important points here to note uh, is the fact that we have the, let's say, the data acquisition unit on the right-hand side. There's a RS-485 converter. Um, with an optic isolator included. You can see this on the right-hand side. Sorry, I'm just looking for my pointer. Um, and then this part of the uh, converter is connected to Mother Earth or the soil. Um, so it's uh, bonded to the Earth electrode, if you'd like. The, the other components in, in this system uh, the earthing points are on the circuit boards, as indicated here. You can see here the shield, the cable, or the shield of the communication cable is bonded at the data acquisition, acquisition side, and it runs through um, without additional bonding points. And the, each of these transceivers, as you move downstream, are then earthed on the circuit boards only. So what, it, what you observe here, in essence, is a single point earthing system. And this is what makes the RS-485 technology so uh, uh, quite robust in an industrial environment that, uh, that where you have quite a lot of electromagnetic interference and also up to a certain point, um, 
disturbances for lightning and so forth. So very attractive from this perspective, uh, the robustness of this RS-485 system. But very important, it depends on that single point earthing system. Now, if we have a, a lightning strike close to this system, you will see that the uh, this is the potential uh, that drops off from, away from the strike point. But in essence, this system is not affected by these potentials that are presented by the uh, ground potential uh, from the lightning strike. However, when we introduce, say, surge arresters at these transceivers, um, we can then, let's say, during the operation of that uh, surge protective device, the, these units, the transceiver un units, will be bonded to Mother Earth or the soil, as you can see here. And in the slide we refer to this as uh, uh, unwanted earthing by the SPD, the surge protective device operation. And I'll explain now what, what is the argument be behind this unwanted earthing uh, during the operation of the SPD. But what is important now is that because now you have introduced um, a multiple earthing situation by the operation of the SPDs, you get this ground potential uh, differences developing between the earthing points. And because the, uh, the levels, as you can see in this ground potential curve here at the bottom, you will have different potentials presented to each earthing point that will, in essence, drive a current or present potentials then to the equipment that may lead to the damage of the equipment. Just to continue this argument about the unintentional uh, uh, operation, let's first look at the intentional or let's loosely to define it as a forward operation. So what we mean by that is this is the typical operation of a surge protective device or how you, you actually require that protection from the unit. So you have a surge coming down the signal line to the receiver, for example. If it's above a certain threshold, the surge protective device will operate and will clamp that uh, a surge voltage protecting the receiver and diverting the energy or the current and to the earthing system as shown on the left hand side. That is in contrast with this what we refer to then as the unintentional or reverse operation of the surge protective device. So when you have a lightning ground a strike close to a, a system as indicated on the right hand side here, um, you will have ground potential rise. You can see here's the fall in potential as you move away from the strike. And as that potential, uh, that the search, the earth part of the uh, search protective device C rise, and it will at, ar arrive at a point where the gas discharge tube will trigger and it will drive a current or, uh, or present the voltage, then uh, the lightning. Uh, ground potential rise voltage to the signal line and drive a common mode current, as you can see in this circuit. This is the unwanted case, and that is what we mean by the reverse operation of a surge protective device. And as I've said, it's a loosely uh, used uh, term or definition uh, just in the context of this discussion. Uh, if you are interested in more details about this uh, concept or the operation thereof, it is covered in a paper that we presented at ICLP last year, and it's it's available on IEEE Explore. So, how did we incorporate this in a, in a numerical model? So, we initially developed a model of a surge protective device, as you can see here. We've got two discharge uh, tubes. Uh, the center point is Earth. Um, we've got these other components just to set up the operation of those gas discharge tubes. And then there is a transient voltage suppressor diode on the right hand side. And we use this IEEE standard 487 to verify the operation of this model of the surge protective device by. In, from the standard, you can see they apply a voltage, sinusoidal voltage to the SPD. And as that voltage rise up to a certain level, the gas discharge, discharge tube will trigger. 
and the voltage will drop down to the arc voltage as indicated in this uh, schematic. So we introduced a sinusoidal uh, signal to the SPD and we actually got this uh, verified the operation of it here. The top image shows you the, um, the voltage source and here we can see the second one from the top uh, presents that I can just find my cursor again. You can see here as the voltage rise up to the breakdown voltage of the gas discharge tube, uh, it drops, it clips the or uh, uh, it clamps the voltage or it clips the voltage up to the arcing voltage. And it's this is what we see wanted to see in line with this IEEE standard. So we were pretty satisfied just from a comparative perspective uh, and the study that we wanted to do that the the model is operating and here you can see the protected uh, part on this side this voltage here across the transient voltage suppressor diode um, showing that the, the the voltage is clipped at the level that we wanted it to be uh, to present the protection so then we uh, introduced the we wanted to see how that rs485 uh, system one it uh, will behaves under uh, ground potential rise conditions here on the uh, right hand side you can see the um, data acquisition unit uh, just a very simplified version of it uh, presented by the input impedance of the opto isolator for example we also introduced uh, search protective devices at various parts of the the system um, and this could typically be a combiner box in the PV plant. This is the model of that CAT5 cable based on published literature. And then on the left hand side, this could be a string box. And here is that communication card that we are interested in, uh, linked by the RS485 cable or the CAT5 cable. Um, the, uh, it is an actual fact in the RS485 communication card that we see here. And again, we have a search protective device here. Um, this is only one of the cases that we are presenting uh, because of uh, the limitation of time. And again, I want to refer you to the, the paper, should you be interested in the other cases. And the circuit at the bottom is in essence the, oh, sorry for that, the um, source of, of the ground potential rise that we presented and then we can in actual fact use this source and introduce the ground potential to any part of the circuit. So this is just a smaller version of that uh, circuit that I just described. The top part is the ground potential rise that is presented by this green dot and that is the output of this circuit. You see that we present that to the earth part of the search a protective device um, as we've indicated um, and then perhaps oh, what is of more interest is this one this one gave the real breakthrough in this kind of study typically uh, indicated by the red dot we're looking at the potential developing here say in essence on the signal line and you can see here the gas protective device uh, keeps down that voltage uh, from the ground potential rise up to a point when the gas discharge tube starts operating and then it introduces that um, ground potential to the signal line and you can see there if you look at other parts of the circuit for example here the part that should be the protected part by the search protective device we see these uh, spikes appearing and uh, you know these vary depending on how you change the model slightly length of cables etc all those kind of things and more details again, as I've said in the presented in that reference at the bottom of the slide. So then we also have a summary and we also looked at induced voltages uh, with and without the surge uh, protection device uh, at the com com combiner box side and the combiner box plus the string box, for example. And you can see here in the initial case, um, and this is what we think led the uh, protection, the lighting protection designers to think that it's perhaps an induced voltage. You can see here significant levels both for from a common mode and differential mode perspective. So the system is not protective, protected, and that might have motivated the installation of the search protective device. Um, 
Um, okay, so looking at the, when you introduce the search predictive device, both at the combiner box side and the string box side, and when the mechanism is uh, from a uh, induced perspective, you can see that you uh, properly protect uh, the equipment, both from a common mode and differential mode perspective. And that is the, that is the expected operation for a search predictive device. However, once you start introducing or once that once uh, ground potential rise comes into the picture, I'm going to jump to this bottom one just to move on in terms of time. And you can see here we've got a search protective device at the combiner box and the stream box. And you can actually see here we see that the reverse breakdown as a result of the reverse operation of the SPD. We see the spikes, and so it's still not protected. So by Perhaps following an approach where you want to counter against induced interference that, would, that works perfectly, if you look at ground potential rise, it actually causes more uh, damage. In, just to conclude then, we addressed the coupling mechanism. We pointed out the importance of lighting ground potential rise in a large utility scale PV plant. The technology that was significantly affected is uh, RS-485 communication circuits with wireline technology. And uh, this is very important to consider lighting ground potential rise, particularly when you have high density equipment in the plant. And we're talking here about sensitive electronic equipment. You will recall that I pointed out the withstand capability, uh, just about one kilo volt uh, on the signal ports and the ground potential rise then exceeding that withstand capability. And the damage mechanism we link to the reverse operation of search protective device on the communication circuits and uh, the uh, ground potential rise then presented by the lightning. So just in summary, the lessons learned, um, it's important to consider uh, when to install search protective devices because if they are applied uh, incorrectly it may in actual fact cause more damage the reverse operation of the spds introduces a multiple earthing system uh, for a technology that relies strongly on a single point earthing and uh, uh, as a result of that you get the lightning uh, potentials from the uh, ground potential rise introduced on the signal circuits that causes the, the damage. So what we are also pointing out here is that um, it's important to understand the technology that requires lighting protection and align that lighting protection then accordingly with uh, a protection that will work adequately or operate adequately and protect adequately for, for the technology. Um, one thing that we also observe uh, in many cases, not only this case, is that lighting protection and other aspects such as earthing and EMC are left until quite a light, late stage in the, the project phases. Um, it would be ideal if these aspects can be considered early in the des uh, design stages of an EPC project or other projects. And because it may influence the te technology se selection for the plant, and it's also important for, uh, for the procurement of e equipment. You can influence the equipment specifications, you can save costs, and you do, don't have to do um, a retrofit on the plant, which becomes quite a nightmare uh, when this is not needs to be addressed or fixed. Uh, and then very important, I think, is also to address the, all the lightning uh, coupling mechanisms. Don't only work with the induction, which is also perhaps a more familiar coupling mechanism, but also address the other coupling mechanisms involved, such as lightning ground potential rise. That, Chair, I want to finish and I hand back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, that's a very, very interesting presentation and a very important consideration. Um, I have, don't have any questions that have popped up in the question tab, but if anyone does have a question they would like to add there, um, I'll give you a minute to do that. Um, otherwise, we'll move forward. And if you've got a question in your head, um, you can add that to the, to the question box and we'll address it later in the Q&A. Um,
Great. Given that nothing's come up, I think let's move on with the presentation and then we'll address questions that come up in the Q&A. So our next presenter is um, Mr. Seath Scobie. Seath graduated from the University of Stellenbosch with a master's degree in mechanical engineering. He's been working in the field of lightning protection for 15 years and is a member of ELPA. He's an adventure seeker and family man. Thank you very much for agreeing to present to us today, Seath, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks, thanks very much, Hugh. Um, can you see me? Yes, we can. I, I <laughs> would agree. I would agree with your sign there. <laughs> cool. Okay, guys. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for the opportunity um, to have this discussion with you all, and for taking your time out of your family time at the moment. Um, just checking. Can everyone see that first slide there? All good? Yep, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, the discussion or uh, and, and I would like to call it just a discussion point that I would like to raise up with everyone today. <clears throat> and thanks for Peter, Peter for the interesting information earlier. Um, is really yes, to talk about the rooftop PV scenario and trying to make sense of it all. So we are often presented in scenarios where uh, solar PV installers or turnkey solution providers are um, often presented in a scenario where they are almost forced to do the lighting protection. And um, it has then, I have tried to evolve this into a perhaps more of a discussion point that we should um, take into, into cognizance now. Um, in order to prevent irritation with your clients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, perhaps something to start off with is, um, you know, I think we're living in a world where, <laughs> I was reading an article the other day, where artificial intelligence has just invented the new flavor of Coca-Cola. Yet, um, we, if you were to go to one of these vending machines and you stuck a 10 rand note in there and the corner was folded, you wouldn't get that new um, Coca-Cola. And at the end of it, um, also, I, I guess, for all you bright sparks out there, uh, perhaps a question for all of you is, what is the square root of negative one? You know, I think often we are always um, at, at, in a, at school um, tertiary education taught there is no such thing as a square root of negative one. And I think the majority of us understand that it does, in fact, exist. And there's just perhaps a bit of understanding that needs to be applied to our approach to certain um, challenges that we face in this industry. Um, and, and again, I'll say that my point here is, is, is along the uh, a point of discussion, not a point of um, absolute um, results. So what I'd like to discuss today is what are we trying to get at here? Um, I've already perhaps alluded to the things that I would like to discuss with you. What is, if you are a um, solar installer, what does the lightning protection risk analysis mean? How do you interpret it? Um, what are the kind of questions you need to look at? Um, you know, often these times you are presented by a so-called specialist and they present a very nice report to you and you cannot in fact understand what has been given to you and how to decipher what what you should be looking at very very um person question in this scenario and again just in terms of rooftop solar pv is how much does the risk actually increase when you put pv on your roof um, in two scenarios i we've done two case studies where we looked at the residential um, scenario and then further to that commercial um, study. So very interesting um, uh, scenario to look at. And, and, and of course, uh, from that, we then uh, looked at um, a few different scenarios. So there are in the real world, world scenarios where we are presented or you may be pre presented where the simplest of all of them is where the the owner of the building is also the owner of the PV. So how do you approach that solution? Um, then there's um, the scenario where 
the owner of the building is also the owner of the PV. However, that existing building does not have any lighting protection. And then the third, perhaps more complex of all, is when the owner of the PV plant is not related to the building owner. Um, and how do you approach those um, typical scenarios? Again, so in overall, like I said, I'd like to give you guys a, a, a broad stroke of what does a risk assessment mean? mean what do we need to consider? Um, how much risk does a PV system add to a building? And I think what very pertinent questions that have coming across a lot in the industry is, at the end of the day, if you are presented to install a project or perhaps awarded to install a project, we often see far too late in the process, like Peter mentioned, that um, the consideration of lighting protection um, essentially comes at the end when you're trying to assess the COC and there you see the questions about lighting protection. So it is something that as an industry, we need to address with the client earlier on in the process rather than at the end and face questions about who's actually going to cover the cost of this. And then the, the biggest thing in all of this is what is the correctly engineered solution? So in my mind, what is an engineered solution? Um, in terms of lighting protection, we are always measuring the, the cost benefits of the solution versus the risk of not having the solution. And we have to take that into consideration. Um, lighting protection is not an absolute um, solution. However, with certain mitigation methods, we can reduce the risk to an acceptable level. What is the acceptable level? And who does it apply to in the context of who owns what? If we, if for example, if we are look, if I'm talking to a client who is only interested in the PV plant, is he then responsible for the lighting protection of the building? And um, we'll get to that um, a bit later. So a risk analysis essentially at the end of the day is um, a, a statistical measure of the probability of damages as a result of four various sources. So you can have a direct strike to your building, a nearby strike to the building, or your, your object, sorry. You can have a nearby strike to the incoming services, so your power lines, your communication lines, and then you can have a nearby strike to either one of those. Ultimately, we look at four categories of risk that need to be assessed in all of the in these in our assessment of the probability of risk the first one is the r1 loss of human life so that immediately stems to a well results in a huge sort of fear factor for people um the loss of services to the public there we're talking about you know your um services as for example electricity, water, et cetera. Cultural heritage, heritage, something not often considered, and the loss of economic value. So if we were to look at those four um, risks, the two that we, we would predominantly be looking at in this scenario is R1 and R4. However, R1 um, will only be applicable in cert certain circumstances, and that will be, for example, when we are considering the building as well. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So the majority of applications um, with solar or PV will be looking at R4, where we are looking at the loss of economic value. In other words, does it make rands and cents um, to apply a cost of a solution that may result in a certain cost saving? And that is the key to, you know, the problem the, to the majority of solutions. Other than obviously in the case of R1, we are looking at the loss of human life. So here's the big question. Um, interesting, very interesting question is when we are putting a PV system on top of a building, how much does the risk actually increase by? In other words, we are making a change to a existing infrastructure 
And we are, yes, certainly introducing additional risk, but how much is that risk and how do we quantify that? And that can um, be calculated by using um, first principles based on the SAN standard um, or IEC standard 6305 part two. In the case studies that we have done, we took a, let's say for now, a typical a residential installation, so sort of a four bedroom house, tiled roof <clears throat> with a five kilowatt hybrid system. There are two factors that we looked at in this um, scenario, and that was the risk of, uh, or the increase in loss of human life and the increase in the loss of economic value. Um, and then we also consi considered a commercial installation with in well in our terms a medium size i think in in common days now it's probably a very small size but this was um uh, 600 megawatt no no sorry 100 100 megawatt plants in joburg rooftop commercial size <laughs> so as you can see there from the numbers if we were to consider the residential installation the increase in the loss of human life is marginal at 1.9 percent and the loss of economic value is also sitting at 5.5%. So I think it almost makes logical sense if you are looking at a residential installation where the panels are sitting on the existing roof structure, you are by no means increasing the collection area of that structure for a di direct strike. Um, and in the, and you, however, you are introducing some additional risk because if the panels were to take a direct strike, they would then introduce a surge into the building that could result in economic loss and possibly a fire that would result in the loss of human life. However, the, in the majority of the times, the mitigation method for that is often a simple surge protection device, as Peter expanded on earlier. In the next breath, we can then look at commercial installations um, and bear in mind here we are considering a building that has no existing lighting protection. Um, and the increase in the loss of human life, uh, it takes a bit of a jump, but the economic value is 75% higher. So to give you a bit of background, in, in, in this scenario, the PV roof, the rooftop PV system pretty much covers the full extent of the building. Um, and therefore it attracts a higher probability of a direct structure. So the question now is how do we approach these different scenarios that um, I've sort of alluded to earlier. The, the most simple of them all is <clears throat> if you are, um, if you have a client who owns the building and has an existing lighting protection system um, that he is then the, well, to be the owner of that system. Very simply, um, confirm the risk of, of, of lighting protection level required via a risk assessment, bearing in mind that although it may have been done um, prior to the solar system, the solar system does increase the risks associated with the building. Therefore, you should um, redo the exercise just to confirm the actual risk. Then the next um, <clears throat> thing to look at is obviously, does the existing system comply to the current standards and the new, it's called a new level of protection. If all of that is in place, the um, position of the, the PV panels, et cetera, do they fall within the shielding of your existing system? Um, if they do, then you know quite simply there is nothing to be added to your system. Um, in 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 the odd occasion, we will sometimes find that the panels um, do in fact uh, fall uh, outside of the shielding of the system. Therefore, there may be slight additions. And when I say slight, it's normally just an air, air termination system for the solar panels themselves, and then the cost of those additions should then fall part of the, the capital project um, carried out by the PV installer. The key thing here, I think, as also um, Peter alluded to, is 
these assessments need to be done right in the beginning. So when the assessment for the PV is being done for the building, it is then the right time to do the assessment um, for the lighting protection of the same building. And this just prevents many, many headaches down the line where you are then fighting with your clients about additional costs and who actually needs to bear the brunt of that. If we then face with a building that has no lighting protection and the PV is then also owned by the building owner. Very interesting point because now we essentially are looking at a, at a, at a, at a, a, a building that even before the PV was um, installed may have required to have lighting protection installed on the building. Much the same as if you go to a building to install the solar and you find that their wiring um, is not compliant. How do you approach this? Um, no defined solution at the end of the day, but again, a very consultative process is required here. You have to consider in this case, R1 and R4, because at, ultimately at the end of the day, your client is interested in his PV system, but also we need to consider the building to advise the client uh, since he is ultimately the owner of the building. And normally the risk associated with the building is the predominant factor in determining if you need lighting protection or not. And again, it, it has to be a consultative process where you meet with the client, do the assessment upfront. He should have had the lighting protection and as ultimately then as, as us or yourselves as a PV installer, should you then bear the brunt of something that should have been on the building prior to your installation? Big question mark. And we face this often with clients and sometimes they accept the costs and they do do it. Sometimes they don't. And then what is the solution then? The third scenario, which um, does bring a bit more complexity to, to the table is what happens if the owner of the PV is not at all associated to the owner of the building? In our opinion, <clears throat> as part of due diligence, um, we would always consider both R1 and R4. And if we are early enough in the program, inform the clients, your clients, the owner of the building that we have conducted a due, due diligence, his building should have had lightning protection and this and and therefore the components of that lighting protection should not form um, part of the scope of the pv system and again it then becomes a discussion and a negotiation with your client is he is he prepared to pay for let's say let's call it his portion of the lighting protection of the building which would then which would typically cover the down conductors and the air termination um, but and then there would just be additional cost of the lighting protection for the solar plant. So those two scenarios need to be distinguished, or the, sorry, the cost of those two need to be distinguished when you present to your client. He should have had this in place. You are now coming to put a solar in, um, um, uh, equipment on his building, and you are now as a as part of your due, due diligence as part of a good engineering solution, advising the client that he should have had it. He may choose not to do it. And then again, what is the scenario if he chooses not to do it and perhaps you are the owner of the PV and you would like to take mitigation methods against your PV system because the risk may be big enough for you to take um, the correct or the mitigation methods required. In in certain circumstances where we have had the scenario where the owner of the building is not prepared to um, accept the additional cost of the lighting protection and the full lighting protection solution is um, beyond the economic, um, let's say, rands and cents of installing it, we can then we will then advise the PV owner to at least install, for example, if we're looking at a, a metallic structure on a metal roof and his panels on top of the roof, 
we will then at least install the air termination system that will prevent direct strikes onto the panels that will then prevent the physical damage to its panels. And again, so this is the, the topic of consulting and um, negotiation and making Ransom sense of what we should do um, to make the best economic decision um, at the end of the day. And uh, yeah, for me, that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, what is the square root of negative one? Um, for those of you who don't know, the answer is I. And um, yeah, thank you for your time. I don't know if there are any questions right now, are you? Thanks very much, Seath. Um, yeah, there, there's a couple of little questions that have popped up, so I think we'll, we'll address those quickly. Um, cool. Some of, and then there are a few other questions that were directed at Peter, but we'll deal with those in the, the Q&A. So there's a question from um, Gavin LaRue, just asking, how does coverage of solar PV increase the risk on a commercial building? I think there's a bit of confusion there where the increase comes from. Maybe you could elaborate. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so when we are considering the risk of a of uh, so let's look at a building or consider a building prior to the installation of of the pv the predominant factors that determine um, the probability of a strike to the building and now i will only um, talk about a direct strike in the scenario or perhaps indirect there are two predominant factors and the one is called the, what we call the collection area so the collection area is well defined by the in simple terms, the height, the length, um, and the width of the building. So the ge geometrical factors of the building determine, and I think that's you know pretty straightforward, that the larger the building, the higher the collection area, the higher the probability that um, the lighting may hit, hit that building. And, this, and, then, and then following from that, obviously, is the lighting flash density. So how many strikes per square kilometer per year, on average, do we see uh, in the area that the building is located. And I, I think that kind of makes common sense. You know, if we have a building that covers, um, and let's just use the numbers for now, one square kilometer per year, if we in Joburg, uh, the strike density is 11.7. So we can expect 11 strikes per square kilometer per year on average for that building. Um, obviously, that's a significant building, so we wouldn't be in it talking that size. So the geometrical factors of the uh, uh, the geometrical parameters of the building determine the probability of a direct strike. When we introduce solar onto that building, we are now introducing an additional source of damage. So um, typically, if we consider just that building, we, if we looked at typically just your S1, which is a direct strike to the building, we now also have to consider the direct strike to the PV installation, um, because that will then in introduce additional risk as a result of um, the cables running into the internal zones of that building. And that's why um, uh, generally you see that the economic value or loss of economic value is higher because there's the potential of damage to your electronic equipment. And again, bear in mind, this is without any mitigation methods. Normally, in the majority of the cases, the mitigation method would be surge protection. Um, yeah, I hope that answers that one. Thanks. Yes, and Gavin's posted a couple of other questions there just on the same mm -hmm. topic. Um, one being the collection area is not effectively changed by the addition of solar. Um, sure. Maybe you can, but I think that you got to that in that point there was it's maybe not so much about the collection area being changed but the fact you now have an additional mechanism to bring lightning current into the building that increases yeah, that, the rate. yeah absolutely and i think i think this is the biggest sort of misconception um and, and from my side the frustration in the in the industry at the moment um as soon as people are putting pv on the roof you're getting certain specialists in the industry saying yeah but you need to have lighting protection but the pv doesn't increase the risk in terms of, um, you know, the collection area and and yes, it doesn't apply common sense here. Yeah. yeah, it's not making it more likely for the building to to be struck, 
but it Correct. is meaning when it does get struck, it struck it, it there's more likelihood of that lightning current coming into the building. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, I think we'll we'll move on to the next presentation now, but um, we'll deal with any extra questions that come up in the chat during the Q and A. Cool. Okay, our next presenter is Mr. Richard Evert. He's also a member of the Lightning Chapter. Um, so Richard Evert, National Director of ELPA, and is an SAI member and SAIE Lightning Chapter Office Bearer with a BSc in Electronic Engineering, MSc in Electronic uh, Electrical Engineering, and his PhD doctorate currently in progress, uh, Lightning Risk in progress. Richard has experienced and addressed a wide range of challenges over 31 years in the power utility and lightning protection industries. These challenges were overcome by collectively engaging with skilled leadership to implement sustainable lightning re resilient solutions. So thank you very much, Richard, for agreeing to take us through um, some of the standardizations where that's at this stage. Um, we're not hearing you yet, Richard, so, ah. Mm. Yes, practicing uh, my my miming. I just want to say it's a, it's an absolute privilege to be, uh, sorry, I started sharing my presentation. Is that visible on the screen? Yes. Thank you. Yes, it is. Okay. All right, so, um, uh, Enough said. Get straight in, straight into it. Um, let me put my camera off. And having the the privilege of of listening to um, Dr. Peter Pretorius and uh, the mathematics of the lightning ground po uh, potential rise and the impacts and the suitable positioning of surge protection devices and the analysis shared by Mr. C. Scobie. <clears throat> A very, a very hot topic regarding PV installations and the rapid growth of uh, the industry has been or continues to be and will be the standards that help to guide us um, of how we should be installing with good uh, or sound sound practices and from a standards perspective the obvious uh, standards that we need to be um, cognizant of is the lightning protection standards, risk management, and then human and asset safety. So the the, the one that is the, the the common one that is linked to the Occupational Health and Safety Act is the scheduled regulations for the LV electrical installations with SANS 10142-1, addressing the safety of human beings and property and assets. Now you've just heard Steve talk about understanding that one of two uh, significant parameters in uh, whatever measures you implement is the lightning ground flash density. Given from that, we would then go into a better understanding what is the probability of having lightning in the first place, the consequential probability of having damage when that lightning does strike, and then out of that, the probability of having fatalities or permanent injuries being probably at the top of the list when we're talking about Human Safety and the Operational Health and Safety Act and our legislation uh, with regard to proper electrical installation practices. And we are re repeatedly coming back to this question of who is responsible. So having said that, when we talk about the standards, the, the obvious is the South African Bureau of Standards is responsible but we also have a international link to the IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, uh, with regard to what standards we use and how we uh, um, develop those. So it's really important that we understand some of the background of the standards that we have. And equally, when we talk about who is responsible, we need to understand who is responsible for the standards that we have in front of us. So the standards are dictated by the South African uh, standards and legislation of the Standards Act of 2008, and I'm just going to pull out. I'm just pulling out two uh, key, a couple of key uh, perspectives. Purposes of the Standards Act is to provide for the development 
promotion and maintenance of standardization and quality in connection with, and then there's a whole string of, um, I know this isn't quite the right term, but blah, 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 blah about the, our, our due diligences. And there is an intention that it, that it is our desire to be able to. And the first one is to ensure provision of an internationally recognized standardization system that can continue, that can, that continues to support the needs of South African enterprises competing in a fast-paced global economy. This is to, to the ends of to promote South African national standards as a means to facilitate international trade and enhancing South Africa's econ economic performance and transformation. It's really important that we don't just look at standards that tell us how to do stuff, but to also ensure that we have equal uh, playing fields that should a, a, a competing uh, service provider come in from another country, we don't disadvantage them. And in, in essence, we uh, false, uh, we, we create fabricate uh, escalation of pricing. Bottom line in terms of the role of the standards of the, of the South African Bureau of Standards in the Standards Act is that they are responsible to maintain the standards. They, the, the standards do not belong to the South African Bureau of Standards. The standards belong to South Africans. And our standardization process, as it is now, is a very good process and is built on the principles of consensus. Understanding that if we, oops, let me just back up on that slide. We need to understand that when we try to uh, compile standards, we end up having people with that are competing each other commercially sitting at the same table. Now in principle, the Competition Act forbids that. You are not allowed to sit across the table with your competitor and um, over a beer, a cup of coffee or whatever it is, discuss the technicalities of our industry and how to improve it. That is the, 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 the uh, line between corruption and collusion and all the other things of disadvantaging, disadvantaging um, the consumer is too large. And as a, as a result, the competition laws are very strict in our country. And um, so it's important to understand that this process of, of consensus is a process that is carefully managed within the South African Bureau of Standards. <clears throat> it's important to, to um, ah, I've lost a slide. Okay, so there are two, holy cow, uh, apologies. <clears throat> okay, so we have in our standardization processes, the South African Bureau of Standards Technical Committee, um, there are subcommittees and there are, <laughs> Uh, working groups that deal with specific uh, specific items. Uh, I wonder if I can quickly crash this and uh, no, Minx went. So, okay. Um, on the left hand side, the coloring is all gone because this is now supposed to be the uh, focused next slide. On the left hand side, where they have the, the South African Bureau of Standards Standards Approval Committee, they are the highest authority in the South African Bureau of Standards with regard to the standardization process. The people that sit on that committee are the employees of the South African Bureau of Standards. Uh, they dictate and ensure that all the processes are in place in order for the SABs to fulfill their responsibilities in line with the Standards Act and to the, the governance and, and our, our, uh, our government. Below them, there is the South African Bureau of Standards Technical Committee. And I'm just going to jump to the next slide so that you can see that. And the South African Bureau of Standards Subcommittees. Now, both of these committees have a responsibility by which they answer to constituencies in our country. The people that sit on these committees are not South African Bureau of Standards people. They are people from each industry. And the description of the kind of people that would be on a technical committee would be, and I just am going to read that straight out. It's a group of representatives concerned with standardization that is responsible for identifying the need for and the preparation of South African national standards and blah, 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 related to a defined field and that reflects the national interests within that field. The point, the, the, the item I want to draw your attention to in that description, that definition, is the duty of the people sitting on this committee is that they are responsible for identifying the needs for South African national standards. Hence, if we are looking at the PV, in, PV industry and the industry starts uh, expanding and um, we start talking in 2010 about how we are supposed to be installing these systems and the wiring code SANS 10142-1 does not have a test report for the PV installations. 
one would expect these individuals to be reviewing the the changes in our in our economy the changes in you know, escom exchange experience severe load shedding all of these threats in those con in the context of those threats the people sitting on this committee are the individuals who are supposed to be addressing what may be or may not be coming um, towards us the subcommittees <clears throat> are individuals that's, it literally is exactly the same description other than because it's a subordinate committee of a technical committee the one thing that is not in here is, and the rest is all exactly the same. The one thing that is not in here is the responsibility for identifying the need for South African national standards. The responsibility is still included in the technical committee in, with regard to the preparation of those standards. So the technical committee is not only looking at what needs to be done and where we need to be going, but they also are responsible to ensure that we do our jobs with regard to maintaining the standards. The, the, the subcommittees is specifically responsible for the preparation of the South African national standards. Now, it's important to, to uh, before I move into the subject matter experts uh, discussion, it is important to understand that the subject matter experts do not represent any industries. Members on the subcommittees and the member on the technical committees represent industries. I am the national director of the Earthing and Lighting Protection Association, and I represent that lightning protection industry now as i look at what is going on in south africa and we we understand that lightning uh, protection systems and the the implementation of those is very closely linked to the electrical uh, uh, contractors in con the, the electrical industry let me put it like that so uh, uh, grouping such as the south african institute of electrical engineers the electrical contractors association the electrical conformance board those entities are all part and parcel of related industries, just as much as the insurance industry of who carry the risk. When we talk about who's responsible, ultimately we will start talking about authority having jurisdiction. And it's not the policeman or the chief inspector that is, is, is involved there, but it is the insurance industry. So as we um, uh, move into this understanding of uh, the roles of uh, our individuals, excuse me, I'm just going to pop back two slides and uh, just re-point out uh, the, the, the bottom line. Our standardization process is built on consensus. Given that we're built on consensus, we need to be careful that when we are sitting with these technical committees and the subcommittees, that we don't populate those committees with people that are all lovey-dovey and, lovey and, 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 and always agree with each other. In fact, what we do want is we want people to be disagreeing with each other. We want individuals to have opposite opinions um, and we need to have them being able to contest their opinions in clashing with each other in order to continue to work to a point where there is consensus such that we are, are assured of having the best of all worlds and, and and when i get into a more detailed slide you will see me talking about the iso 31000 and addressing asset management and what is required in um, the asset management processes on the right hand side, and I, I realize my next slide is also uh, missing, but so I'm just gonna refer to on the right hand side where we've got experts. We issue from these committees, the subcommittees and the technical committees, we issue uh, projects and those projects would be by way of a standard. If there is an existing standard and it needs to be revised, it is called a project and it is issued to a working group made up of subject matter experts. In this instance, one of the things that we don't want is for a subject matter expert to be always talking about what's going on in the industry and uh, you know we, we, by example pv systems there is uh, immense damage and we need to be changing the industry we need to make, be making strategic decisions that's not the role of the working groups when you listen to dr peter pretorius that is subject matter expert discussions being able to nitpick and and, and to 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 certain extent uh, Many people will be extremely bored or have lost him after he's talked the first couple of paragraphs, we've all we all lost because um, he's the subject matter expert. And we need those to ensure that we have all the facts correct on the table and not influence. Now we have a challenge where we need to understand that we the, these the participation in the South African National Standards and the South African Bureau of Standards is all voluntary. So if there is no money, money in it, the, the willingness and enthusiasm to participate is um, somewhat diminished. 
So now we talk about the, the international relationship with the IEC and the slide is slightly busy, but essentially I've taken what I've shown in, in the previous slide uh, with its all its proper color, colors, obviously. So on the, on the right hand side, we have the South African Bureau of Standards as facilitator of our standards. We have the Standards Approval Committee. Technical committees are, com, com, uh, are put together on specific areas of our industries. And we have subcommittees below those. We have projects uh, initiated that experts will work on. When they finished with the work, they hand back what we would call a committee draft. And it's the committees who then would decide whether the, the, the committee draft is acceptable and they would vote on it. But first they would ensure and, and work very hard to ensure that we got the best consensus. But the final decisions in the committees is voting. Final decisions in the working groups is absolutely not voting. The conveners of those working groups have to work really hard to get the best out of all the working group members in order to get the best that we have possible. Now, as we work with the international um, standards over on the left hand side, we have the IEC driven by the standard standardization management board. They have different uh, technical committees for different areas of, of electrical systems. And the entire grouping that you see on the left hand side is only subject matter experts. There is nobody there that is representing uh, industries or, or, or constituencies. Why? Because what you should be seeing on the right hand side, this entire grouping of, of individuals and, and entities, that becomes the individual that is re, re, uh, determining whether or not we accept a standard coming from the IEC. So what you will see is this uh, uh, draft, committee draft. Well, let's start with the black lines. So the black lines is we offer leadership to those technical committees in the IEC and the subcommittees in the IEC. We also contribute South African subject matter experts as experts to participate in what they call maintenance teams, working groups, or task teams, depending on and project teams, depending on, on what is specifically required. The management of those teams is driven by these uh, IEC subcommittees. When the work is done by these maintenance teams, the information is fed back to the technical committee to ensure that it's all consistent and that there is no confusion between one standard and another, no duplication. Then that information is then transferred back to each uh, international member. So South Africa is one member. We as a, as a subcommittee in, on, in within the SAB standardization process would receive these committee drafts and then we would vote on whether we accept it or not. So you understand that there's, in a way, we have the parallel processes where we contribute subject matter experts, they do not vote. They work on the, uh, the, the best details possible. The document is produced as a committee draft sent back and our sub, SAB subcommittees will then vote on this. So this might be sounding like a bit tedious now, but the in, in goal here is when we are subject matter, we, we have our subject matter experts volunteering to contribute when we add our subject matter experts to experts from all over the world, we suddenly start getting a much better international flavor of what needs to be done. I keep on hearing about things that South African requirements are unique, but I can assure you that that is not the case. Um, and so moving on to some of the processes of the uh, lightning protection standards, I stole this, this picture. I can't steal it because it's come from my own association. If you've got a calendar, desktop calendar from last year with the Electrical Contractors Association, you'd be familiar with this. I'm going to spend a little bit of time just going through this. This is a flow chart of the entire lightning risk management processes. On the top left hand side, what we need to understand the difference between electrical installation and the risks associated with sticking your finger in a plug, which is 24 seven while there's electricity, you will be shocked, as opposed to lightning risk where lightning only appears when lightning appears, it's not a 24 seven thing. So the SANS I, and stroke ISO 31000 is a document which walks through a feedback loop of um, risk management whereby you have stakeholders, like insurance company would be stakeholders, the electrical industry would be stakeholders. Property owners are a massive component of the, sta of the stakeholder uh, body, understanding that property owners defer their risks to insurance companies. And that is why insurance companies inevitably become the authority having jurisdiction over final decisions in terms of liability and who should do what. And so it's important that we ensure that these entities and the stakeholders are all fully aware of what, the, what, what, what areas are involved, such that we don't over-design and, and, and unnecessarily implement 
risk mitigation that's completely unjustified and produce poor results. Now, the poor results and good results is really, really important. With the way that we've been operating over the many years, we don't have that. And so the drive here is really to bring this a closed loop. So you would have heard SAN 62305, the first uh, part of that in terms of the risk management that uh, Seath referred to in terms of the uh, uh, risk assessment and understanding is we talking about risk to, to assets, risk to people, activities, wherever you are, and obviously the massive part is the exposure. Now, understanding that when we talk about that exposure, we are talking about lightning. If you are in the, uh, on, the on the west coast of South Africa, lightning, you probably see it from time to time every 20 years. In, um, in uh, Belleville, in, in Cape Town, uh, a similar experience completely opposite to Paul Petersburg and Petra Tief areas where you're experiencing lightning several times a day. So lightning detection with the IUC 62858, it's currently not yet a standard ad adopted by, by South Africa. It, it will be, proposals are, are being tabled for it. In South Africa, we have the South African Weather Service with the light, Southern African Lightning Detection Network. That is uh, month on month, they're busy um, improving a, a, and a, in, enhancing and, and uh, advancing the technologies that they're using to give us reliable empirical data to understand where the lightning activity is, when it's occurring, and how frequently and how big it is. With that kind of information, what we are doing with the qualified lightning risk is to then prepare ourselves for the appropriate risk that we face. Now, there's two, two ways to, to look at this. The first is where we have assets that need to be protected. The second is we have environments where the lightning poses a threat to human beings. So example, from a recreational perspective, would be sports grounds, a golfing fraternity, massive on the power utility side, uh, uh, staff that are busy working on a power line that need to be pulled off the power line prior to a storm arriving. So we have the, the warnings and, and each entity and each industry needs to establish their own standard operating procedures, protocols of what they need to do when we know that a storm is coming. When we have enclosures, a, a very hot topic over uh, uh, several years um, has been a lightning safe uh, uh, facility enclosure where, by example, on a golf course, somebody rushes into a what they perceive to be a lightning uh, safe facility only to find that it's uh, made up of reeds and a bit of grass and, um, in fact, possibly more dangerous there than, than elsewhere because there is no designs behind it. So the early warning or the thunderstorm warning systems would fall under the SAN 62793, which is an IEC uh, developed standard. Um, okay, so that's on the, on, the, on the risk treatment when we have to understand what to do prior to a storm arriving, and it is a matter of procedural arrangements. Where we have systems like what uh, Dr. Pretorius and uh, Mr. Scobie have shared is we've got an asset that needs to be protected. So there's two parts in this protection. And the first is we want to, the, the best way that we can protect a building from lightning is to ensure that we give it a controlled path for that lightning current to flow in. And that's what lightning protection is from a perspective of the scheme and the strategy is really simple. Give it a path for lightning current to flow in. It is not appropriate to, to look at a building and say, no matter what, you have to have lightning protection. The first thing to understand is maybe there is already inherent lightning protection. So what, what, what the term that would be used would be natural components, an IBR sheeting roof that is well bonded to uh, the, maybe it's a warehouse or whatever it is, and it's got solid I-beams um, in, in the vertical structures. And those at the bottom of those vertical structures, the I-beams are well bonded to, to earthing planes. And when you have done your risk assessment, this uh, SAN 62305-2, processes of trying to understand the risk, you start understanding where the lightning current would go if it hit the building. Now, out of that, you would then utilize SAN 62305-3 to put in appropriate uh, air termination systems for, for lightning to strike so that you're within your coverage area that you decide. Given that you now have an enormous amount of energy that needs to be conveyed to ground, you need to ensure that you're adequate, you have adequate capacity of your down conductors to carry that current. Then, of course, when it gets to the ground, you now have this problem with the soil resistivity, the earth resistance or impedances, and we have that fact, that parameter that um, Dr. Pretorius has so eloquently shared regarding the lightning ground potential rise. That lightning ground potential rise does not go away just because you've got a lightning protection system in. So it's imperative that when we understand that the SAN 62305-3 
tells you no tells you what to do to put a lightning protection system in the designer must also take cognizance of that lightning uh, lightning ground potential rise and he or she needs to understand where that rise is and do we have people do we have assets that are sitting on that profile and we need to appropriately then ensure that we have equipotential bonding now sometimes this gets very confusing for people because equipotential bonding is just bashing cables together no you're trying to ensure that like you are in a boat um, on the on on the on the sea on the ocean you have had this massive tsunami coming towards you and you would hope that while you're sitting in this boat the boat will rise and fall with the level of the water you don't really care whether it rises 10 meters or one meter as long as all parts of your boat is going up together equipotential bonding means on one side of the building other side of the building everything is at the same voltage whether it's 10,000 volts or one volt makes no difference potential difference between those two points are the same so the tricky bit here now comes when you have a electrical supply and you can't bond the two sides so the obvious is we put surge protection devices in to ensure during that 100 200 microseconds when lightning will strike lightning current is being dumped onto the system this current is flowing to ground through an earth impedance the lightning ground potential rise is taking place during that rise what you're wanting to ensure is that the surge protection device closes and both terminals are sitting at the same voltage during that period because we're talking several hundred microseconds rather than milliseconds it is a, mom a moment momentary switching type exercise and you as an individual are safe with regard to voltage differences so this is now the part when we move over to this 62305-4 and over voltage management <clears throat> We, Richard, sorry to yes. interrupt you. Just to make you cognizant of time, I think we should go for another, give you another five minutes. Just to, Am I boring you to tears with the same slide? Well, I won't say that, but <laughs> I know you've got some other interesting No slides, problem. So okay. Let, All right. But look, the, the bulk of, of the rationale where we go from here and, and what is in the standards is really linked uh, um, to this point. But thank you. It's a I, I've got a picture in my mind is busy unfolding and, and clearly I'm, I'm losing you. Okay, so where we have these 6305 standards are linked to the IEC. We also have a SANS 10313 standard, which is an in-house in standard, but it is specifically linked to 62305-3. It's a supplement to the controlling the lightning strike to a building, ensuring that we have equipotential bonding throughout um, and, and so now when we when we look as this whole thing is implemented, I just wanted to point out with the 62305-4 that the exercise, when you when you see the what um, uh, Dr. Pretorius has, has described about the positioning of search protection devices, simply putting a search protection device in can, is not the appropriate approach to, to uh, uh, proper over voltage management and search, search protection measures. Mr. Scobie has also infer really the, the same thing that some thought has to be put into where and how you, you're applying that surge protection devices now the reality is when we when we look at what we have implemented in the past and as we do, as we evolve with the, the pv installations in south africa we start seeing failures and really what we want to be able to do in that feedback loop of the sans 31000 is to be getting information back to see how successful we are so on the one side we've got lightning data on the other side we've got losses and claims and when you combine those of tying up the losses and claims with the lightning activity we get a performance measure of how successful we are and so over the the, the longer term of of implementing appropriate standards we start getting a, a, a idea of how we need to be guiding our risk risk assessments and the manner in which we implement those such we revise the risk treatments to then in, in turn improve the, uh, the, the performance. Now, all of this requires participation from the Department of Labor, from our insurance industry, electrical uh, um, in, uh, contractors, um, lighting protection people, et cetera. All right, so let me, in moving on from there, to give you an understanding of the, the role of uh, the SABS technical committee, the lighting protection standards and the electrical installation standards falls under SABS Technical Committee 67. So, so the on the right hand side it would be the SABS uh, Technical Committee. It's called Electricity Distribution Systems and Components. Under them is the subcommittee, subcommittee six, which is for electrical installations, 
And then through the South African National Committee of the IEC for TC64 is a mirror committee. So this is now electrical installations as the heading implies. We then work directly with the IEC Technical Committee 64 dealing with electrical installations and protection against electric shock. Under the same SABS Technical Committee 67, we've got the IEC, we link to the IEC TC81, which is the Technical Committee for Lightning Protection under the same installation subcommittee. So as we're going forward, you'll see a little bit later that the, te the, te the Technical Committee 67 for SABS is responsible for an enormous number of uh, technical areas that is going to, is being looked at. Now, I just want to point out immediately the, the uh, procedures and methodology for lighting protection uh, systems is these four standards. Uh, 62305.1, it says general principles, but it's a lot more than that. 62305 part two is the me measure by which we define uh, what lighting protection is necessary, if at all, and if there is lighting protection required, what lighting switch protection measures are required. Now, 62305 part three and 62305 part four is the practical implementation of the designs that, come, that comes out of the risk management processes. It's really important when you look at these is that the designer of the lighting protection systems, the lighting protection solutions, is absolutely critical in these processes. And you will have heard already both Dr. Petourius and Mr. Scobie talking about how that consideration really needs to be early on in a project. Now, this, this list of standards, these eight parts, there's now a ninth one uh, starting, are all about the different components that we should be using. Now, it doesn't matter whether we are talking about lighting protection of a house, uh, explosive areas, or PV. These are the components and these are the standards pertaining to the components that we need for lighting protection. The reason why I have uh, part eight uh, struck out there is because that is a technical specification currently, which is being uh, implemented as an international specification. And the, the part nine is protection for uh, where, where you may find yourself uh, potentially touching dangerous uh, voltages. So as we're moving on now, the LV Electrical Installation Standard, SANS 10142.1-1, is the electrical uh, um, regulatory standards that we have. I'm just going to read out what the intention of, of the standard is. The aim of this part of SANS 10142-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1
However, it's also important to appreciate that, so let me just back up on that slide. It's also important to appreciate that when we are talking like this, we are holding electrical inst installer, uh, master electrical installation, let me just say master electricians, we are holding them liable and uh, failure to, to comply is, um, is severe penalties, go to jail and all of those nasty, nasty things. So the, the, the reality is that when we change a standard, we can't simply change the standard. We have to ensure that the electricians have completed appropriate training, have demonstrated appropriate competency through practical work and field work exactly as we have in the national qualifications framework. So there's a there's criteria that as we start bringing these things in, where we have neglected the processes is we don't have the same leadership in the PV environment as we've had in the electrical environment over 100 years. So there's there's some uh, element where we would like to point fingers, but pointing fingers is not going to change the reality of where we're at, that we need to be moving forward. So where we're at right now uh, is that in receiving the, the, the conflicted issues from my working group, we will be moving towards implementing a test report in SANS 101.42-1 as with uh, immediate, uh, in immediate, I'm going to just use the word with immediate effect to the extent that the, the working group responsible for this wire, for the wiring code of SANS 101.42-1 will be focusing on how to accelerate the means by which we have the test report in and that the items on the test report measure up to what the master electrician is capable of doing. Should there be any de deficiencies, we have to address with urgency the training programs, the qualifications, and we, we, we also need to move away from this perspective of that the, the, the government training programs and education facilities is inadequate, we must come up with our own. Whilst that is recognized as a, as a weakness that we are dealing with, we have to work collectively together to address our training program such that that matter is addressed. And when we hold an electrician liable and accountable for compliant workmanship, it will be because they have completed their necessary qualifications to the required standards. So having said that, this matter, and I'm bringing this up here, is search protection devices is uh, filtered throughout the SANS 101.42-1. And when you look at the details of it, more of the, of the content of discussions of surge protection devices is related to lightning-induced surges rather than other over-voltages. And as a consequence, I'm asking whether or not the content in SANS 101.42-1, which is making this document really big, is it shouldn't be in there. It should be in the SANS 6 to 305 documents, and then we incorporate a regulatory references to that standard such that we can adhere to the appropriate uh, processes. Firstly, number one, known controlled lightning dissipation paths may produce over voltages that have to be controlled with surge protection devices. That's talking about the lightning ground potential rise that uh, Dr. Praturis was talking about. Uncontrolled lightning dissipation just simply means you don't have lightning protection. So lightning could hit anywhere. Now, when we understand that lightning could hit anywhere, we then also need to understand, well, okay, uh, is a surge protection device going to help at all? Because our problem with lightning is the amount of energy that the building or items have to try and absorb uh, in, in, in coulombs that is way in excess of the system. So also when we do start implementing, what is the absorption capability of the surge resistors that we are adopting, knowing where the lightning current paths are? So the final comment there is surge protection purposes of controlling lightning surges must be implemented in tandem with the known anticipated paths that lightning current will take. There is no electrician that is trained and competent to be able to do that. So when I see the clauses and things like a little dummy's guide to doing a risk assessment, um, it creeps me out. And so these are the things that we need to be addressing. This slide just simply demonstrates an overloading of our uh, SABS Technical Committee 67. Those are a list, of, you're not, I'm not wanting you to see the, the detailed text, but those are all the IEC technical committees that our current SABS Technical Committee 67 is responsible for. And as a consequence, we have a resource management issue that we have to deal with. And it's amazing, got some lightning going on in the background. So in, in closing, just to re-emphasize that whenever we talk lightning protection, it doesn't matter what structures or what systems you're talking about, you've got to start with these standards. These are the standards that need to be dictated. There is no shortcuts. There's no, body, no other uh, writing up a little uh, dummy's guide that, that we can shortcut things. 
And it's important that we understand the impact of search protection measures rather than simply talking search protection devices. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That, thanks. That is very good to see an overview of that stuff. Um, it has long eluded me. Right. I think we'll turn to a, a, there's not a lot of questions, but there are a few going back to even Peter's presentation, which I think if we can, it would be nice to just get some comment on. Um, I'll start from a, a very first one. Peter, are you there? Uh, yes, thank you. You. There was just a comment from Tony Rayner, just um, a very general comment, comment um, just talking about the subject of bonding. But I, I think I know you've dealt with this, but maybe you just have a brief comment about the general issues of bonding you've encountered on solar installations. To see here. Did that come through? Sorry, are you going to are you going to show the question, or where can I see uh, that? I, no, I don't think I can share it. I just have to I can just pose it to you. Oh, okay, absolutely, that's no problem. Thank you. I'll wait for that. So, do you have a brief comment on 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 bonding in PV systems? On bonding. It's a very general question. Question, but yeah, just on the subject of bonding. Um, yeah, sorry. I think. Uh, sorry, Dr. Pretorius. Uh, Hugh, can you be a bit? Can we be a bit more clear? Uh, bonding in what sense? In a, just general, because we're talking about equipotential bonding. We're talking about bonding yes, between agree, components. Equipotential bonding, bonding yeah. on PV systems. Got it, Pete. Did that? I mean, Peter, no. if you don't have a comment, then that's fine. It's just if you did have something. No, that's uh, I've got a comment. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's uh, if you study uh, the principles of lighting protection, the concept of equipotential bonding comes uh, to the front, um, and it's. Uh, I think it's very important to understand what is actually meant by that. Um, you know, when you talk search protective devices, that uh, the the earthing part of it or the equipotential bonding uh, is a very important component of that search protective device to to allow it to to operate efficient effectively. But uh, what is important is that uh, we also need to understand that. Uh, because of the high frequency content in the lightning current and uh, voltages, uh, you in essence lose equipotential, uh, the equipotential effect of an earthing system. And uh, it may be uh, in terms of a few volts across a few meters, but it can also extend. And here, the, the soil resistivity and the impedance of the system comes into play. It can actually extend to uh, several kV over a few tens of meters. So uh, I think that is important. I think there's, there's in general, a kind of, uh, I, I want to uh, state this carefully, it's not a misconception, but one has to treat this uh, concept of equipotential very carefully because there's um, in discussions with uh, personnel on the ground, typically you know, at, the, at the PV plant, you may find uh, when you talk about equipotential, there's a kind of a interpretation that you will get to have a kind of a zero voltage across that entire plant, and that is not true. And it's mainly because of the high frequency content that we are dealing with in the, in the lightning strikes, uh, whether it's current or voltages that you're talking about. And, uh, you know, I think once you, you um, uh, think about it in that sense that you, you've got to be careful, it, it's not a zero volt or equipotential plane across the entire plant or over large distances, then you would understand that uh, you, can, you can get lightning uh, damage as a result of ground potential rise, for example. Yeah, trusting that is, that is fine, yeah. Thanks, Peter, appreciate that. Hugh? Um, Yes, Richard, I've just got another so, question. So just, so just yeah. to uh, ex extend on what Dr. Pretorius has said, is the, the effects that we're talking about is the LDIDT, is the, the uh, transient 
uh, rise time of current flowing in a conductor. So if it's a if it's DC current 10 meters or 100 meters of conductor, you don't have a, 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 a voltage rise. But when you've got a, a change in current in the inductance, uh, so your voltage across the conductor where the current is flowing through at this high frequency that Dr. Praturis is talking about, you've got an LDIDT. Inductance multiplied by the rate of change of the lightning strike. Now we know the lightning strike can reach a maximum of within five microseconds. So the IDT is we've got 20 kiloamps divided by five microseconds is five times 10 to the minus 10 minus six. Sorry. So when you add those numbers up, we end up with a massive number multiplied by no matter how small the inductance is. And 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 so we need to be cognizant of that uh, as well. Sorry. I'm going Richard, to... I've got a couple other questions coming in here. So let's. Peter, sorry to just um, keep you there. I think there's a couple of questions that have popped in based on that thing. Um, Mike, first, well, firstly, Tony has, Tony has replied with, how, did, how do you solve this problem at a PV plant? I don't know if you've got anything to address that or is that um, quite involved? I take it as the, the problem of ground potential rise. <laughs> okay, so uh, let, me, let me take it uh, kind of a step back because the initial step that you want to take is uh, follow the standards that uh, Richard has mentioned, uh, 62305-124. But here's the thing, I mean, those four standards uh, cover about 420 pages and in not one of those pages, you will find the term ground potential rise or earth potential rise. And uh, you, you actually got to study that very carefully to understand that that entire set of standards were prepared based on the kind of approach that you would follow or introduce isolation devices and what they mean by isolation devices is for example fiber optic systems so that is a, a perfect solution to the wireline technology that we've discussed but you you know um the thing is with the standards is that you will miss that if you don't realize that uh, that it's gpr is not covered by the standards and you will do your risk assessment and the risk assessment will tell you perfectly that you're not going to anticipate or get any uh, significant number of uh, damages or injuries but then uh, it will be totally wrong because gp ground potential rise is not covered by the standards so the 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 um short answer to that in terms of how do you solve that is uh, use fiber optic te technology then you have you can steer away from uh, significantly improving the uh, earthing system because that that's not a solution it's not practical it's not cost effective kind of thing yeah. to uh, adequately in, uh, improve the earthing system Thanks. trusting yeah, that will um, help thank you yeah that's a very clear answer there um just a quick comment last one i think mike fisser has just asked would you agree the primary bonding destination for equipment would be the nearest buried earth conductor trench not point in large PV systems. Yes, but again, I mean, uh, we've seen that, uh, you know, you may bond it, you, you may introduce, like we've indicated with that RS-485 system, you uh, you can do a, a, a perfect bonding of the surge protective device with a, a earth connection less than, say, 5.5 uh, uh, meters, you know, comply with all requirements. But uh, because they are spaced apart, some meters, 10, 20, 30 meters apart, you under lighting ground potential rise uh, conditions, you get that uh, potential differences that are then pre presented. Together with that reverse operation of the SPD, you, you get the damage introduced. So despite the fact that you comply with the perfect installation of this SPD, uh, you've got to take cognizance of these uh, uh, damage mechanisms that may be presented. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, there's a couple of questions for you, Richard, on your presentation, but there's just one for Seath I want to jump to quickly, and then we'll get to your other ones. Uh, Seath, are you there still? Are you able to answer a question? Yeah, yeah. I'm still here. Um, this is just from Cohen Furry. He just asked, have you ever had sites with direct strikes? What was the associated dam damage? And can you co compare the um, the PV, I'm guessing he's saying the PV solution, the compare this to the cost of air termination system. Yeah, very good question. Um, if I can just revert back to what Peter said, um, or was uh, discussing earlier, um, Peter, I think the 
the answer there is really when we are just um, considering these kind of very um, difficult questions in terms of GPR over small ranges or long ranges of cable, there's only one way to work that out. And, and really you've shown it with, with your um, computer, let's say simulations, et cetera. And that's where the tool we use, um, CDEX is so powerful. So yeah, let's go back to that question. Okay, have I ever experienced um, lightning strikes? Yes, uh, we have done um, multiple installations in Joburg for data centers, which in these days are occupying, you know, significant square meterage. And um, we do do uh, six monthly inspections. Very interesting, you know, to try and look for a lightning strike uh, when you're doing an inspection. So normally we just see the typical, um, black or carbon um, um, indication on the air termination system. Um, absolutely, we have seen that in, in many situations. Um, what, sorry, can you just hear the, the second part of the question was? I'll pull it up now. The, um, yeah. And I think this is specific on PV installations. So yeah, yeah. what was yeah. the associated damage? But I think, and then the second part was, Compare this to the cost of air termination system. I'm not quite sure he, what he was asking. Yeah, about. okay. I, I, I think I get the gist of that. So, yeah. um, not a straightforward answer. Let's put it that way. Uh, Maybe uh, I can um, give a little bit of my interpretation there. I, I may have picked up in your presentation that our discussion of direct strikes and increasing the risk you would still recommend that you still need an air termination system on a building to protect against direct strikes regardless um, of pv or not no no okay okay so uh, okay. yeah I'll take a step back so that in that scenario we we were considering if um let's say for example you were installing a pv system on top of a building um and that building should have had lightning protection in other words it was in all probability, um, going to suffer a strike, a direct strike of lightning. If you are then installing the PV, what is what should you do then to ultimately what we're looking at here is to protect your assets. So in that scenario, we are only considering the R4, so the risk of economic loss. And in that scenario, we have to look at so so to to paint the picture here you have a building that you can put a PV system on. The building owner is not interested in what you're doing. You are effectively renting the space. You're gonna put a PV system on and then you're probably, you know, uh, wheeling it through the municipality or whatever you're doing. But it's your asset at the end of the day. And you want to take the most economical decision to protect that system from damage. What is that decision now? So. We, we then have to consider two scenarios. The one is obviously we do the risk assessment for only considering R4. Um, if it in, in R4, we see that it could potentially be exposed to a direct strike, then there may be the, the mitigation method may be that you need an external lighting protection system. In the majority of the cases, let me just take a step back. The, the, the R4 will, in 98% of the times lead to the correct surge protection. However, if the footprint of the solar system is large enough, then it may, may uh, be an outcome that, yes, you should take uh, precaution against direct strike. Then there are two, con two scenarios to consider. Do you install a full system? In other words, your down conductors, down to the ground, the earthing system, et cetera, everything, or do you only then consider that you install masks that protect your panels from suffering a direct strike? Um, the second scenario um, will not result in like a COC for lightning protection, but as the asset owner, you are looking at the best economic decision for your installation. And those are the two that need to be considered. Right, thank you. Um, okay, um, Richard, there's a question, a couple of questions here just on your presentation. The first one is from John Pancola, just asking, why has SAB not adopted the IEC standard on the lightning protection of PV? I don't know if you can comment on that. 
That is a very good question. So the uh, lighting protection standards on, on, on PV falls under the IEC Technical Committee 82, and um, there is just recently produced a 62548 uh, standard that is related to electrical installation of PV that is very closely uh, linked to the Technical Committee 64's um, install, uh, electrical installations standard for PV, which is uh, 60364-7-712. Now, the debates regarding adopting those is very much, I mean, the, this is the question that I was uh, leading in with regarding to our working group and, and convening it was, um, what are the reasons that we elected to go with a separate standard and why are those standards not adequate? Now, if we're talking specifically the, the electrical, the lighting protection of PV, that, that uh, kind of like a mini, mini, for, mini standard, all of those standards are now being reviewed to the extent where we're looking at the IEC 60364 suite of electrical installation standards, and then all related standards of how we need to be need to start adopting them as suites, such that our regulatory documentation uh, cherry picks the important regulatory clauses by which we can provide guidance for our electricians and our designers of things that must be done, and then the criteria and and uh, guidance regarding breaking down the, the uh, risk analysis perspective. What is the asset risk management priorities of the, the asset owner and the insurer that provides the um, security to that, to that asset? So the, what I can say to you right now, uh, talking about the past, um, you know, our role in industry, uh, both the lightning chapter with the SAE, uh, but uh, as, a, as a lightning uh, um, center of excellence, South African Weather Service Driving Lighting Detection Data, the Earthing Lighting Protection Association, um, and numerous other bodies are driving towards a, a better awareness uh, across all industries in South Africa, such that we can start optimizing. Because a lot of this effort is, is related to volunteering. And, I, and um, as I, I raise, and the reason why I raise the, the, the uh, matters of a technical committee and, and subcommittees is that often these questions, uh, as what John has just raised now, is not asked at the right forum. So in a technical committee, you need to be asking, is this necessary and why, in terms of, of what is available, what are we brought together and, and what are we not? So we've got uh, some lightning outside that's massive. Um, sorry, uh, John, that's right. okay. Next question. Thanks, Richard. Um, great. Uh, this one's a, just a matter of clarification, I think. It's just, Mr. Evett mentions that master electricians as electricians are responsible for issuing COCs for electrical solar insta installations. Is he saying that installation electricians registered with the Department of Labor will not be allowed to issue COC for solar installations? In other words, is it only master electricians that will be allowed to issue COCs? All right. So, so, so my my background is as an electrical and electronic engineer in the power utility for 28, 29 years, and uh, standards. Uh, outside of the of, of Eskom, we're kind of you know, it's, you know, everybody else is trying to catch up to Eskom. Um, my role now as the national Light, national director of the Earthing and Lighting Protection Association is focused on ensuring that we um, don't talk too much and do too little. And so our documentation that is so geared and complicated in many instances is overcomplicated. So the kind of a debate who is actually authorised to to sign off documentation uh, that that is a fairly extended conversation, but what you need to take out of my mouth is the person that is authorized to sign, whoever that may be. And as the, as the criteria changes, the Department of Labor and et cetera, whoever that person is that is authorized to sign needs to be competent in the material that they're signing off. And if there is no uh, recognized training program that is commens commensurate with the, with the manner in which I got my uh, engineering degrees and commensurate with the diplomas that electricians have got and complied, completed their traitors, if that kind of competency isn't, it doesn't match up, then we're missing this something and the Department of Labor cannot uh, prosecute individuals for not complying with what is written into our standards. So from that perspective, uh, the individuals that contribute to the standards cannot be people sitting in air-conditioned offices and have no idea what's going on. And hence, we need to be ensuring that we have subject matter experts contributing to these standards, and, 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 and we do. Um, possibly we have too many people that are not subject matter experts uh, throwing spanners in the works, but 
people like the Electrical Contractors Association, um, etc. And uh, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Uh, if I've misspoken, thank you. Next question. Yes. So and just looking finally, at the time, it's um, seven o'clock now. Yeah, I've, we've got a final question here. I think this this is a general question that could go to anyone. So uh, Peter, Seath, Richard, anyone who's got a comment here. But the question is, in um, wireless internet service provider setups, where there are towers that already have protection against lightning strikes, is there a need to have lightning protection systems for backup power PV systems? I don't know if any any of you have a comment on that. Can I, uh, given my, I'm, I'm up there now, the, the, the first statement is, if the facility has got lighting protection. Now, if this facility has lighting protection, that would mean, uh, similar to what we're talking about rooftop PV, is if the building has lighting protection and you put uh, PV on top of the roof, how much do you change the profile that any portion of that PV system would fall outside of the protection area where these funnels, uh, just one of the questions regarding uh, is it you know, uh, air terminations versus PV lighting protection? The air termination is a part of the lighting protection system. So in these systems, if there is already lighting protection, the first step, as uh, uh, Mr. Scoby said, is you can presume that the lighting, uh, li the risk assessment was done correctly. But as a designer faced with, an, with, this, with this information, what we really want is what was the criteria for the original design. So there's a there's an aspect that we need to be moving forward in, in, in capturing historical information so that we have got a historical record of what has been done on a building and, and why. So we can assess whether the lighting protection that was put in was, was under-designed or over-designed. The risk assessment wasn't appropriate, but ultimately, if there is lighting protection, you have to start with that and then ask yourself individually and on merit, is this item exposed? And, and when we do have that lightning ground potential rise, these components, um, assuming I'm understanding the question correctly, your backup uh, services, auxiliary supplies, do they, um, are, are they still on the same equipotential plane? And um, if we are talking about long conductors, is it necessary for me to pull down the, the, the uh, uh, earth plane at a few points to reduce the, the, the long length impact of uh, an LDIDT, LDIDT um, uh, high frequency transient. Uh, Peter and uh, uh, Seath, please, I'm going to put my camera off because it feels like I know I'm. Yeah, I, I, I perhaps just, just have one comment there. I think, um, you know, when you're considering an installation like that, so um, again, I revert back to the risk analysis. We're talking about R4, so the risk of economic loss. Um, often when you go and let's say retrofit these type of installations, you need to um, be very aware that the reason why they are putting um, battery backup systems in place is because they cannot allow for the system to be down. Therefore, the, the risk of that system being down um, will result in um, significant economic loss. So in that case, then all precautions should be taken and that should come out of the risk assessment or the mitigation methods and in you know whether it be the external light protection or surge protection to level one with you know the highest level of potential bonding it all depends on the where the site is etc cetera, etc cetera. so the fundamental um, point is ensure that the risk assessment is done correctly and in a i will say it again in a consultative process with the client you cannot sit or send a drawing to some specialist and you get a 40 page report and, and, and that without having any sort of consultation. So that's the key thing. You know, it's a, it's a professional team approach. And um, what is the installation? What are we looking at? What is important for the client? And uh, how do we protect that? Did you want to add to that? Yeah, so, yeah, just a short, uh, very brief, uh, just to make sure that you cover all coupling mechanisms with the existing uh, uh, protection system and uh, with the new installation. Thank you. Right. Well, in that case, we've come to, oh, I see we've got a couple of last questions that have just slipped in. Um, Richard, are you, would you be up for answering one last question there? 
I, I would, but let's just can we just quickly check with Minx um, in terms of the time oh, time yes. frames of the of the uh, uh, webinar? Yes, no problem. Please go ahead. Okay, so this is a question: Are the SANS TC and sub TC committees adequately skilled and informed to guide initiatives such as SANS 10142-1-2 in the current South Africa? Okay, so. I appreciate that there is a, a an element of subjectiveness in in the way the question has been asked. Uh, are they competent? Um, to be to be honest, our our challenge is not so much that they are competent or not competent. Our challenge is that across our industries, the industries aren't fully appreciating their responsibilities. So when we talk about this, um, we, this is a, a, a an event hosted by the SAIEE. The South African Institute of Electrical Engineers are responsible or are taking the lead with regard to electrical engineering in South Africa. And as a consequence, SAIE must always have somebody attending to the technical committee that covers the area of interest that is specific to them. And it's for that reason that the lighting chapter are driving and ensuring that we do have necessary representation on the technical committee to, do, to deal with all, all matters related to the, the the role and con, uh, contribution that the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers give. Um, do we have enough representation? The answer is absolutely not. Um, the the participation is is poor. Uh, we would go with that word. However, at the same time, um, you know the the mandate is on the on the on the South African Bureau of Standards to maintain the standard uh, or to make yeah to maintain the standards, but. If you have to go and beg uh, uh, massive organizations like the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers to ensure that their the nomina nominee is, a, is attending the, the, the committee meetings when you only have one meeting a year and it lasts for maximum five hours. So in five hours, you, you're addressing all the, 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 the issues related to the electrical industry. That's unacceptable. So I guess there's kind of a two parts to your, to your question. Do we have competent people? Yes, we have. Do we have consistent representation to understand? The answer is no. So there's a there's a there's a portion of re, uh, responsibility across industries in South Africa to start taking ownership. It's very easy to blame the the the, the new regime or whatever fancy words once wants to be wants to use. Our standards in South Africa belong to the people, and as a consequence, it's really more about the industry. Let's talk engineering. Uh, the uh, uh, consulting engineers of South Africa. What is their role? The construction industry, what is their role? And so it's the reason why I've pushed and, and, and talk about ISO 31000, SANS 31000. That's not something that's been linked to lightning protection. I've got a, a WhatsApp message suggesting we need to find a way to merge them. No, no, the, the, the uh, ISO 31000 provides the framework that we need to work within. So uh, uh, nearly two years ago to, to the day, we, we hosted a webinar on lightning and the empirical data and understanding what it is that we're working with. And so there, there is a, and then, you know, I'm going to, I waffle too much or I use too much substantive information. Um, I hope that answers the question. Next question. Thanks, Richard. Um, this is probably more directed at Seath, but um, let's get his take. And then if you've got a comment on that as well, um, what should the protection angle be for finials on rooftop to protect the PV system? I've experienced many differences, opinions by different electrical engineers, what the protective angle should be. Um, okay, quite a quite a simple answer. Um, if you're working in protective angle uh, method, um, you're probably from the 60s. So the more preferred uh, method is the running sphere method, which is you know easy, re really simple to do with 3D modeling. Um, software, but the the fundamental question back is then what is the angle or what is the radius of the sphere, and that all stems from again the risk analysis. The risk analysis says to you, you need a lightning protection level one, um, right. which is stringent, or level four, um, which has a radius of sixty meters. So it all stems again back to that. Yeah. Yeah, right. it's, it's not a it's not a uh, a uh, there's one one value applied all to to all systems. The old number used to be 45 degrees, and that has gone a long time ago. The moment somebody asks a question like that, it means they're not familiar with the, with the current lighting protection standards, which mm -hmm. just by the way, 62305 is currently uh, being 
the the new edition three is coming out now uh, of the four parts that are being staggered but the current edition that we have that is still active is was first uh, to, produced in 2010 in south africa we adopted a south african nine, uh, national standard in 2011. so we're talking about a standard that is 12 years old and um, when people are, are, are informing consumers and, and the teams about a, a fixed angle that we apply, you must appreciate that we are talking about somebody that's working with a standard that goes way back to 2004-2005, pre um, yeah, SANS 10313 version edition 2, which is like, yeah, that comes with the Stone Age. Next question. That's it. Uh, we've come to the end there. Awesome. Um, so I think we can call that the end of the event. Thank you to our presenters. We really appreciate your time. See, thanks for being able to do this while on the road, as it were. And um, thank you all Indeed. to the attendees for joining us tonight and taking the time. Absolutely. It's been great, guys. Thank you very much. And uh, thank really, you very much, thanks, Dr. Thank Pretorius. you. Thanks. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Richard. Is driving thousands of kilometers. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Apparently, that's the Wolverine. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.